my friends, we've come to the point now after routing out the inlay here, or the inlay cavities, I should say. I could wait and put the inlay in here first before I glue the neck on, but it's really no harder to put the inlay in there afterward. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and get the neck set correctly. And then while that is setting, I'll be making the truss rod and just try to keep things rolling here. So, I guess I'll get out my jig and get everything ready to glue up. My friends, I forgot to uh, turn the camera on on the uh, putting the glue in the joint here, but I've already put the glue in the joint. I've laid the, it together and it's already holding, I'm sure. This uh, little ramp here goes across here. This is kind of sets the uh, bridge height, if you will, for the fretboard here. Um, this jig is made so that without the fretboard on here, this will make sure that the neck is at the right angle. So it works really well. I've used it for years. And the only other thing I want to do here is uh, get a clamp on this just to hold it in place. Although it's pretty much already perfect because I, I had cut the neck angle and everything by hand and it really is very accurate. So it lays on there really well and lays on here really well. But I'm just gonna double check um, for straightness before I actually put a clamp on it. I'm going right down the center line and it looks really pretty darn good. I don't see how it could be any better. So I'll put a clamp or two on that just to hold it in still for a while. Actually, I can't even get a clamp on it. It doesn't look like I'm going to have to slide it over to get a clamp on it because I can't even get a clamp on it the way I have it laying there. Just as a sanity check, I'm going to check the straightness again because you don't get a second chance. Looks perfect. So now I'll put the, put the clamp on it now. I think I can get a clamp on there. Seems to be just right, so we'll let it sit like that for a couple hours and we'll move on. The neck has been set in several hours. I've drilled two holes right down the seam here and they're quarter inch holes. I've got quarter inch dowel here. I also cut a groove in the dowel so the glue can escape as you drive it in. Otherwise it airlocks. So, Anyway, I'll put a little glue in the hole too. It should go in there and be solid. You can hear it hit the bottom there, hit the solid part. Now I'll saw that one off. Flush. And I'll put in the other one. Yeah, someday it's going to be just like a Lloyd Lore, worth a million dollars. You'll be telling your grandkids, yeah, I knew that guy. He, he was so colorblind. It's amazing he even got a mandolin built. I am ready to put the back on this thing. It's going to be a beautiful mandolin. I Really, that back is just gorgeous. It's And the sides are... It's gonna really pop. I've already signed the inside. I always sign and date the inside up here. That is when I think of it, which is most of the time. I, I might have missed it on one or two mandolins. But anyway, I always sign and date it here. This is the date that I close it up. It's not the date, it, obviously, that it's finished. 
but it gives you some idea in case the original label ever comes out approximately when it was built. So, here we go. This area right here on the heel is the most important area on the glue joint because there's so much stress on the neck. So this is one area you definitely want glued well. You don't ever really want to take a chance that this would come loose. So sometimes I'll even take and spread a little bit of extra glue on the other part just to know that it's going to have good coverage. And really that's true for just about all instruments, all stringed instruments. You really want to make sure that neck is glued well. And of course the tail block too, because there's a lot of stress there too. The sides are important, but they're nowhere near as important in terms of the structural integrity of the instrument. I'm not going to show you the rest of putting these clamps on, but uh, you just got to make sure you get them all on there and try to get everything lined up as well as you can. I'll show you what it looks like when I'm finished with that part. Well, there's what she looks like all clamped up. We'll probably let that set uh, either several hours or even possibly till tomorrow. I've got to work on the truss rod and after I get done with the truss rod, then the only other thing I've got to do to this mandolin is a fretboard in terms of building and then it's just all decoration the inlay and the binding and all that kind of stuff well my friends for you i'm sure it's only a matter of seconds but for me it's been a couple of weeks since i've really been working on this mandolin and uh you know i have just had so many things going on in my life with and not to mention other instruments to work on and different things so there's just been a lot of reasons why i didn't get back to this but I am really at the stage now where this is where all the work starts. And, you know, I say that and people think that I'm just saying that to sound, you know, dramatic or something. But I am not exaggerating at all. This is really where all of the work starts. You know, building it up to this point really is fairly quick. In fact, I'd say two thirds of the work is left yet. I know a lot of people would probably disagree with me, but in my opinion, especially on an F-style mandolin, right now is really where the work gets started. Uh, I've got two-thirds of the work left to do, in my opinion. You know, all of the cleaning up and the detailing and then all of the binding work and the staining and the finishing and all the inlay, and it just, oh, there's just so much. So uh, that's what I'm doing. I spent a couple hours yesterday cleaning up around this scroll, clean, you know, getting all of the wood even and smooth. Did that all with chisels. Presently, I'm going around the edges trying to get the edges all cleaned up to the same thickness and depth. And, uh, you know, again, uh, complaining about this, uh, this kind of wood, this uh, quilted maple, boy, it, it just fights carving in any direction. It doesn't matter which way you go, it doesn't want to be carved, period. So that's making it a little bit more complicated too than it ordinarily even would be. But it's going to be worth the effort in the long run because it's going to be a beautiful mandolin. And I'll uh, do some work off camera and if I get into anything that I think you're going to want to see I'll turn the camera back on. It's about the time to get the truss rod put in here. I have made the truss rod. You can see this is just a brazed on nut that I made. It's a square nut and it fits down in this slot and it fits in there really tight and it won't spin once I get it down in there. The other end of course goes down through and into the truss rod slot up here. I also have a filler piece under here that will take up the slack underneath this area. I might have to work on that a little bit I, now that I see it, but it doesn't quite fit the way I want it to. But anyway, it goes underneath there like so, and that will take up the area underneath back here. And then the truss rod itself has a very slight underbow in it, and then it comes out into the truss rod area, and then we tighten it up right here. And then that's when you tighten it, it pulls that underbow out, and that's what keeps the neck straight. So anyway, the bottom line is it's about ready to go in there. I'm just double checking to see if I'm happy with that or if I need to work on it some more. 
It's probably all right, but I think I'll work on it a little bit just to make it fit a little bit better. I believe we got her about as close as we'll get it. And I'm gonna go ahead and glue this part in. Anytime you turn the camera on, the glue always clogs up. That's kind of like a rule of videos. All right, maybe now it'll cooperate a little bit. In fact, I think I'm just gonna put the glue on the bottom side of this because it really doesn't have to be glued in all that well. And that'll keep some of the squeeze out from getting all over the place. And I can put this in like it's supposed to go here, hopefully. See if it's gonna go down in there correctly. I got that in there, and now I'm going to glue in or fit in a top piece that fits over the top. I've already cut the curve pattern in the that matches the top of the truss rod, but now I've got to get it to fit in this slot and underneath this. And underneath this veneer right here all the way down to the end as far as I can So that's what I'm going to do right now is try to get that all fitted in there And it might be a real task, but we'll get it done eventually So I'm just starting with a line there a reference point where I can saw some of this off Now that I think about it, I'm going to need to slice this off. So I'll probably just go ahead and slice it off to begin with. That'll be a little easier. I don't need very much because it gets pretty thin. So I'll just get, give myself a, enough room there where I can make another one out of the piece that's left over down the road. Well, I need to put glue on this. I have to be very careful on this. I don't want to get glue down on the truss rod or a lot of squeeze out around the truss rod. A I mean, minimal amount would be no big deal, but you know, an excessive amount would be bad. So I am just putting a very, very light trace of the glue on this. And yes, I know about soda straws and all that good stuff. I've done that method before too. But I've really gone to the method now of where everything fits so snug and tight that a soda straw doesn't give me the, you know, I, it just doesn't fit tight enough. So I prefer to do it this way. I haven't had any problems with this. You are fitting it up rather tightly. There's like no room for error, margin for error here the way I do this. Everything's a hammer, except that some hammers work better than others, and that one's not working that great. So we have to go to a real hammer. It fit in there dry, but with the glue, it's getting a little tacky, and it's not going in there as well. And I had to be careful that I don't wedge this up here and bust this out. So. It's in there as about as tight as it's going to get, I believe. I'm just going to go along the seam here, put a little bit of glue, just kind of use the bottle kind of like a syringe and force the glue down in the seam a little bit. Not very much, but just a little. Same way on this side. And then the last thing I'm going to do is go ahead and put a couple of clamps on this just to uh, make sure that it's down in there as good as it can be down in there. That's pushing it down in there pretty well. And lastly up here, I'll just put another one. I don't think I even need this one up here, although it did move a little bit. So that's probably fine. That uh, will set up and we'll you know, keep the truss rod perfectly, you know, uh, in place. And that, that way, just the least amount of tension on the truss rod will put stress on that neck and make it straight. So it'll be good that way. And you can probably see the nut that I made there to go on this. I also made a special washer, so the washer would be nice and small and would not protrude above 
the truss rod cover area. And I'm only just snugging that up. I'm not even putting any tension on it at all. In fact, now that I see that that's actually loose, I'm gonna to try to tighten this a little bit. Maybe put a bit different clamp on this because I want that down. It's down pretty good, but maybe I can get this a little tighter. I think it's okay. It's definitely below grade there, and that's the main thing. It has to be below this area here, and it seems fine. The area is big enough to get a adjustment wrench in there too, because that's another critical thing. So often these things just don't have enough room to get a wrench on them. Then you got problems. So this one should work out just fine. Well, my friends, I would love to tell you that that was the easiest inlay job I ever did in my life but I'd be lying through my teeth if I said that. This is seriously, that was the hardest inlay job I ever did, even when I cut them out by hand. This was all cut on the laser cutter, but every single piece of that made me fight for it. I couldn't even tell you how many dozen times I cut these different parts out. As a matter of fact, I did it probably a dozen times two weeks ago and just finally gave up. Finally decided today was the day I was gonna make it happen. And I cut it out at least another dozen or two times today. And every single time it would just say sorry and it would either burn the piece or it wouldn't cut all the way through or you know, make the least little change in the, in the uh, laser cutter and everything would just go to heck, you know. Um, it would tease you and almost cut all the way through and you thought, okay, I think I can make this work and try to cut it out. No, it wouldn't work, it'd break. Finally, I figured out what the secret is. And so I'm gonna pass that secret along to you in case you have a similar situation. It turned out the secret was the height that I was cutting from the laser. I knew that was important, don't get me wrong, and I had already previously figured out what the optimal height was, which, and it turns out it was right at three eighths of an inch, 375 thousandths of an inch from the bed of my particular laser cutter. Yours may be different. But anyway, I thought I was at that height. Obviously I was not. <laughs> Once I did set it at that height exactly, it cut like butter. I mean, it has changed everything. So the height was the critical issue. Just so you know, in case you have that problem, you don't have to spend hours figuring it out. I didn't think the height was that critical. I mean, I, I knew it you know, have to be fairly close. Well, turns out on these really delicate parts, you better have the height exactly right. And so when I got it exactly right, it cut it out just perfectly. Now there are some spaces around, you know, that's gotta be filled yet and all that. So it's still in the ugly duckling stage at the moment, but, uh, Man, I've, if I was a drinking man, I'd be at the bar right now, I gotta tell you. <laughs> at least it's finished. You know what? It only takes me like a week or so to get it to this shape, and it takes me weeks on top of weeks to finish it. So if that don't tell you this is the hardest part, I don't know what will tell you. <laughs> this finished stuff is for the birds. I would love to, just have Caleb be up to the point where he's really good at the finishing and just say, here, Caleb, here, finish this. Because <laughs> I can turn them out left and right if I could do that. Oh, <sighs> I'm gonna go have a cold one, a Pepsi. <laughs> See you later. Well, my friends, the part I'm making at the moment is the fretboard extension and I've got it made and you can see there how it sticks up off the top and the fretboard basically sits on top of that and that steadies up the end of this once you get it all glued together. So it's all made and formed and I have spent way too much time making this perfect as I can get it. It's time to get it glued in place. So that's what I'm gonna do. I seriously spent more time on that than it deserves. You gotta do what you gotta do to make it fit, you know? I think I'll just clamp that with a clamp. Often I put a screw in that to hold it, 
but you know I think it's going to be fine I'll just put a clamp on there and hold it for an hour and then we'll move on I already said I've spent way too much time on this but guess what I'm going to spend some more time on it because I failed. It just isn't where I want it. You know, I don't mind it being a little low of this because I do like to have the fretboard fall away up there at that point. But on the other hand, that's just more fall away than I want. Uh, there's probably a good four millimeters by the time you get out to the tip out here. And two millimeters would be all right. But it's just too much. So, I'm going to have to break it loose from there. It didn't have much time to get stuck. Bummer. Just not happy with it. We'll do it again. Well, my friends, I have made a new one here. You can see that was the old one. And here is the new one. And it's not real, real, real close. But it is perfect, so I guess that'll have to do. I don't know, you know, we can suffer through it, I think. <laughs> no, it really is just fine. It's, uh, you can't see any daylight under the ruler anywhere, and it's just perfectly straight. If I want a little fall away here, I can sand that fall away into the tail there, and I typically do sand a little bit into it, but I'll do that after it's glued up. So we're going to go ahead and put the glue back on this, and... Call it finished. This doesn't need a ton of glue, just enough coverage because you don't really want a lot of squeeze out on this. And it doesn't take much clamping on this either, by the way. So I'll probably just put this clamp on there for a little while. The glue has a good tack to it after just, oh, 10 minutes or so. So it's really about all it needs to be clamped up, but I'll leave it clamped for a half an hour or so. One last sanity check, just running it down through there, and it's absolutely flat. I seriously do not see any daylight under that ruler at all anywhere, so you can't do much better than that. So we'll let it sit for a little while, and then we'll try to move on to the next thing. It's time to put my body points on this. By the way, I have, uh, you know, I've got the extension on there now and, and I've also filled in the little pieces in front of the extension there. Um, so anyway, they're just lightly contoured. But now I'm gonna go uh, get these uh, body points on here and start getting it ready to put the binding on. And once again, Colin's tool uh, works really nice for this because I can level across there. I've already drawn lines to the point where I think I need to uh, take this down to. And I just basically do that by eye. And, you know, I just, each one of them is just a little different every time, but uh, that's the way I do it. The place I've been true wasn't sunny. have it my friends it's flattened off I'm going to use sycamore binding on this again so I've got to find a piece of sycamore that will fit these spots and that I can carve to the proper shape I've got both of the strips glued on there I didn't film that I, I just use CA glue because you can't clamp these very well um, so I just CA glue held them in place spritzed them with the accelerator after a few seconds and they seem to be fine. I don't think they'll come loose. Now I have to uh, shape them to uh, kind of fit the body style. And I'm going to start with the rough shaping with this and see how that works. I've done it before, I believe. <laughs>
give you a tip or two on what I'm doing here. There's, you know, by roughing this out with the sander, you would think, well, you're, you're either going to remove too much wood or make a mistake or something. But, you know, you can you can be precise with almost any tool if you just know how to use the tool, I guess. And one of the key things is that when you're doing this, you watch this edge right here, this leading edge, and you keep that edge straight. You know, so like, and I call it the leading edge because on the instrument, it is kind of the leading edge. When you're sanding, it's actually the trailing edge because your sandpaper's pulling this way. And this is the trailing edge of the sandpaper, if you will. So you watch that edge and you keep it straight. And when you're doing it on this side, then you watch that edge and you keep it straight. And as long as you do that and then watch, you know, you still have to watch your angles this way so that it contours to the body and all that. So there's a lot of things you have to watch at one time doing this. But one of the key things is to watch that edge right there. And same way down here. And I haven't started on this side yet, but you can kind of see where I'm at. And, uh, you know, I'm watching this edge right here and making sure I keep that edge straight. Now I'm going to go to this other side and pull it around to match. And again, you, you look at the contour of this and you can see that it's got to pull down and around. So that's what I'll do on this side now. That's about as close as I dare get it right now. And I call that roughed out, even though it's getting pretty close to final. I might actually be able to get a little bit closer on this back side here, and I think I probably will, but for, for the most part, that's, that's pretty close, and it'll just take a little bit of hand, you know, sanding and or maybe even the finger plane a little bit, just little things, chisels, different things like that. But I am going to go ahead and work on this back side just a little more because it's just a little bit rough yet. That's pretty close, but we're going to work on that some more by hand. We'll see how it goes. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, I get to cut the binding on my F-style mandolin. <laughs> yeah, I'm being facetious. I would just about as soon have a couple of rope burns. I mean, cutting binding in an F-style mandolin is just about as much fun as getting three or four really good rope burns. Um, yeah, that's about how much fun it is. It really is a pain in the neck. I mean, you think that all this work up to this point was the hard stuff. You ain't seen nothing yet. You, sh you should cut the binding slots in one of these just one time and you'd be going, oh my gosh. <laughs> so here we go. Well, my friends, I have spent entirely, and I mean entirely, too much time trying to get this thing adjusted to cut the binding slots. I have probably spent an hour just trial and error and it just says I'm not gonna work. I mean, you know, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like I'll adjust it one way and it'll adjust 10 times as far as I, as I moved it, you know. I mean, it's just nuts. I was trying to use a small a spiral flute cutter that I use for inlay work. It was an eighth inch size and it's not, this is not designed to use that, I'll admit. But I couldn't get that to work. I've used it before, but I can't get it to work. And now I've gone to the large deal, which is not worth a darn in my opinion. These are, cutters are just crap. It's that 115 Dremel cutter. But I've got it adjusted about right. I'm gonna try it on a piece of this scrap maple. And scrap is using the word loosely because this is a nice little piece, but it's the only piece I've got. So I'm going to try it on this and see what the tear out is. I'm afraid it's just going to tear it out so bad that it won't even work. So here we go. That's why I wanted to use the inlay cutter because I th it didn't figure it would tear it out near as bad. But man, I have tried and tried and finally gave up with that, trying to get that to adjust correctly and work correctly. And it just won't work. Well, you can see instantly it burns like crazy. Yeah, these cutters are just crap in my opinion. They just really are, these 115s. They used to be bad when they were spiraled. But they used to be spiraled, these 115s. Now they're straight fluted and they've just gone from bad to really horrible. 
I mean, they were bad before, but they worked. Now they're horrible and they don't work much at all. This might produce acceptable results, but it's, you know, it's really burning. And I can, by the time I get around the whole thing, this thing is just gonna be on fire. And even that didn't cut as deep as it measured in my testing. This is only measuring at 50 thousandths of an inch deep, and I really want it to be about 75 thousandths. So, you know, I don't know why everything just keeps fighting me on this, but that's not making me feel real good. Went back over it to see if that deepened it any. A little bit, but not much. It's at 60 thousandths or so. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to have to be the one to design a better deal here because this is just, it's close and it's the best thing there is at the moment. And even this, I already extended this piece out here to hold it with and that helped a lot, but it's still not designed very well for the kind of work we need to do and the detail we need to do. So I may back up and punt here. Well, I've run through a lot of scenarios in my head on how I could make this, and I do think I could make one maybe a little bit better, but I'm not sure it'd be enough better to make it, to warrant all of the trouble. Um, so I'm going to try it like it is for now and uh, see where it takes me. I sure hate that cutter. My goal is to design one where you could put the spiral cutter in it inlay cutter and do a better job because those inlay cutters cut without a lot of tear out. I'm afraid this is just going to burn and smoke and just be a pain in the neck, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to start on the spruce side because it's softer and let's see what happens. Even that may be a disaster. Well, it didn't do too terribly bad on that. Um, a lot of fuzzies. It would be nice if there weren't so many fuzzies, but that happens quite often anyway on this spruce, so I can't fault it too much for that. I'm trying to cut the fuzzies off here so I can measure it a little bit to see if it's measuring out okay. I don't think it's as deep as I want it. It's it's measuring about 74 thousandths, which is pretty close to what I was going for. That's about it, I guess. I don't know. Not real happy with it, but it's about as good as I'm going to get, I think. It's almost a quarter inch depth there, which is what I was going for. About a little less than a quarter inch, actually. So I guess I'll just keep doing that and I'll show you what it looks like when I get further along or if I run into any problems, I'll show you what they are. Well, truthfully, it didn't turn out too terribly bad on the, on the top. Uh, of course, that's the softwood. Uh, it is still a lot of work. Perhaps you can see all the little fuzzies around the edges. So there's a lot of work to clean that all up. And of course you can't get that tool in everywhere. So you have to, you know, you can only get it up so close to things. And so you have to do the rest by hand. It didn't turn out too bad, but it just didn't, it's not that consistent. It's really hard to keep it consistent. Like right here, it looked like it dug in a little bit and we'll have to work with that to smooth that out and clean that up. It's just, it's just marginal at best. Um, the way this works. But then again, I don't know of anything that's that much better. So, you know, I guess I shouldn't complain too much till I can figure out something better. But I think there's got to be something better than this. One of the biggest problems with this thing is, and, it, and I don't know how to fix that either, is that the sawdust jumps out on top of here and then you're bouncing over the sawdust and it will also tilt your tool in this way because of that. Well, and it happens instantly. You can't like, I don't know, if you had maybe an air thing to attach to this to blow the air on it, that might help. But boy, it's, it's really not fun to do it. It's just not fun. 
I'll finish it up and show you what it looks like. All things considered, it didn't do too bad. It burnt the heck out of it everywhere. It was smoking like crazy. The, you know, it got hot the whole bit, just like I figured it would. But all things considered, uh, you know, it didn't tear it out too bad. So that's the main thing. And now I got a lot of hand work to do to do all the rest of the detail because all of this has just has to be done by hand. There's no other way to do it. So here we go. Well, my friends, I'm going to use this cutter on the Dremel to hand route the rest of this. Now, you know, this is one of those deals where I feel comfortable doing it this way, but I'll be honest with you, you might not get very good results doing this because this thing wants to jump around and jerk and all that. So I find the key to doing it by hand is to make sure my hand is on something solid, like right here on the corner, lay this on the corner as well, and then work it like so. You know, you can really be solid this way. You won't jump around too much. Let me just show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. And again, then the other secret is you take away 80 to 90% of the material. You leave that last little bit to be done by hand with chisels or scrapers, planes, whatever, knives, whatever it takes. So I don't try to get it down to the very last detail with this. I just get it as close as I can get it. So that's how I'm going to be doing it. I'll show you what it looks like when we're finished with that part. As I was carving this by hand, it dawned on me I should mention one more key ingredient to doing this by hand, and that is that you want to make sure you're not using a really large bit here. Do not use a large bit. Use a bit that's about, oh, an eighth inch, which would be approximately three millimeters, 125 thousandths. So, you know, roughly something about that size is just about perfect really. If you use anything with a big diameter it'll grab and jerk you all over the place. You can't do a big diameter at all. Smaller than this would just you know drive you crazy probably although you could use one smaller than this if you got into some real detail locations. But uh, in general this is just about the perfect size. Uh, I wouldn't recommend anything bigger. Well my friends Caleb saved the day. I was getting ready to go ahead and start the binding process and Caleb says, well, aren't you going to stain it before you put the wood binding on it? I said, yeah, yeah, I was, I was planning to do that. <laughs> no, the truth is I get so dang many interruptions and, and, you know, and then I get so focused when I finally get to work on it. I'm so focused I can't think of nothing else. And then I start thinking about the next step, which is the binding, but really it should be the staining in this case because of the wood binding. If it was plastic binding, then the binding would be next. I'm glad he reminded me that. And so I've got a piece of scrap wood here of the same type. Matter of fact, out of the same tree, out of the same board. So, um, you know, so many folks have said they want to leave this blonde. They don't want to see it, you know, stained. Well, you know, sort of, you know, there's about three or four reasons why I can't do that. Well, I shouldn't say can't. Why I won't do that, I guess, is a better word. Number one, you know, when you put a light, just a shellac over this, yeah, it does show off a lot of the grain. It does make it pretty, et cetera, and so forth. But for me personally, there's two problems with that. Number one, it doesn't show off as much grain as when you stain it because then you get all these contrasts and boy I mean it really shows the grain off a lot more when you stain it. Now staining it really super dark will of course hide some of it and that's what we do around the edges but the reason that's reason number two this reason number two is that we want to stain it dark around the edges because 
no matter how good you are at making one of these F5s, there's always little tiny flaws around the edges because it's so complicated. You know, traditional uh, sunbursting with the dark around the edges is to hide those little minor flaws. I mean, that's just the truth of it. And so, yes, we will be doing that. Now, I will try to do this one similar to that Canada mandolin, which wasn't real super dark, you know, and, and it had uh, nice sunburst to it with the, uh, you know, the darker brown edges, but they weren't real, real dark. And you can really see the grain very well. So bottom line is we are going to stain it, uh, you know, and unless the customer would, would, you know, would call with a last minute reprieve or something. But uh, right now that hasn't happened. So we are going to stain it. And I've got a practice board here because I've never stained this kind of wood before. So I thought I might as well just start out and, and do it the way I always do it and see what it looks like that way first. And uh, so let's try that. And we'll get out the yellow. Actually, that yellow is spent. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the yellow here on this one side and just see what happens if I just do it like I always do it. And so far that's looking about like normal. Didn't seem to take it much different than the other wood does. In fact, I'd say it takes it almost identical to the way the other wood did. The only difference is, for some reason, it showed up those real dark scratches there that you can see by my finger. I don't know why, and those scratches went real dark. So I'm not sure why that happened, but that might give me a clue that I wanna make sure this is super smooth before I stain it, because if every scratch is gonna turn dark like that, which is crazy. All right, well anyway, it did what it did. Now I'll try the dark brown around the edges here, just kind of like a similar to a sunburst and just see what happens. And then, you know, I lightly come in on the, on the center here. Now that's way too dark right now, of course. But then we take the alcohol and we go back over it with alcohol. So let's see what happens when we do that. Now I have to admit this board wasn't sanded as well as it might have been sanded. Hmm, it's looking okay. It's a little darker. It's taking it a little darker than I expected. I wanted to try it the way I always do it first because, you know, no point in reinventing the wheel if it works. And, you know, I'm sort of okay with the way this is working. It's really turning out a little darker than I was planning on. And yet it doesn't seem to get lighter either. So you can see a lot of curl and movement in that though. All right, so I'm gonna try a different technique on the other side and uh, we'll see what that looks like. I'll be back with you in a minute. Well, you know, that's not a bad look. You know, I'm okay with that, but we're gonna try a different technique on this side. And, you know, many folks have said you need to seal this be first. I've had good luck both ways. I've sealed wood before and not sealed it most of the time is the way I normally do it. I normally don't seal it and I've had pretty good luck with not sealing it. So I'm gonna try sealing this because it, like I said, it is a different species that I'm not used to using. The way I'm going to do this is I'm, I'm sealing it with, uh, this is just uh, clear shellac. And by the way, that'll kind of give you an idea of the way it looks with the clear. And it looks all right, but you know, to be honest, to be honest that, that looks nice, but that doesn't, do it for me, really. I mean, it looks okay. I don't have any real complaint with that, and, and if the mandolin was that color all over, it'd be all right. But it, you know, it doesn't really, you know, trip my trigger all that much either. Anyway, so I'm gonna just seal it with this 
clear shellac. This stuff dries pretty fast. And then what I'm really going to do is sand it fairly smooth to the surface, hoping that the shellac has penetrated and will keep the stains from going too deep into the wood is my idea here. And uh, we'll see what it looks like by then applying this same technique on this side and see what happens. Be back with you when that's all dry. Well, my friends, the shellac is suitably dry. I sanded it smooth. It's much slicker now. You can see how it slides across this table where this barely moved. So you can tell there's no finish on that side. There is finish on this side. So anyway, with that finish on there, I'm going to try the same basic technique. And that is start with the yellow first, see what happens. Now, uh, granted, these are alcohol soluble dyes, so it's possible that this may smear or create a problem. I don't know. It does seem to grab a little bit. That's really beautiful, I have to say. I do kind of like the look of that. But it is kind of a pain sanding that shellac. It fills up your sandpaper really fast. It sticks to your sandpaper. Of course, I didn't let it dry as long as it could have dried. If I'd let it dry overnight, that would have helped it some. That really did do a nice even job of putting the yellow on there. Now the question is, what will it look like when I put the brown on there? And will there be any way to blend it is the next question. So. Here's the brown. And then we'll lightly cover the middle with the brown. And then we'll come back with just pure alcohol and see what happens. Yeah, that technique's not going to work very good. It pretty much wipes it right back off, which is fine in one way, but it doesn't blend it like it does on this side, you know, sunbursting it. You can see how it gets light and then darker and darker and darker. This kind of doesn't do that. So I'm glad I tried that because that's not going to work very good on sunbursting. I mean, it's, you could, uh, you know, we could do it with the, uh, little sprayer, I forget what you call it now, the airbrush. We could sunburst it with the airbrush perhaps, but I use the airbrush on this technique anyway, so, you know, I don't think I see much advantage of doing it over here. I think I'm gonna just stick with the method I've been using. This method just didn't do it for me at all. And it's a lot more trouble sanding that shellac smooth is a real pain in the neck. Real pain in the neck. And when you get it on a body that's shaped like that, it would even be a much bigger pain in the neck. So it is what it is. I'm going to do what I always do. It's going to turn out the way it turns out. And if I don't like it, by gosh, I'll sand it off and do it all over again. Well, that exercise was not a waste of time at all. I learned a few things that I wouldn't have known without practicing that first, and that is that it always shows up the flaws worse on uh, wood when you put the stain on it. That part's not a question, but it shows me how much this type of wood is going to show up the flaws, and it looks to be extreme. So I'm really going to go back over this and sand it some more, try to get it even smoother, because I can see little problems in this uh, surface of this wood. As I told you, this wood has been a real nightmare to carve anyway. So I'm just going to go back over it again and maybe spend a couple hours just trying to sand it some more and get it just as smooth as I can get it before I start the staining. I have spent quite a bit of time with 320 sandpaper sanding this area here. 
And even after all that, I still see little tiny flaws in this wood where it just did so much of that tear out. So it's going to take a lot of work to get this perfectly smooth. I don't think you can see it in the camera. I don't think it'll show up. It's just little microscopic everywhere. I don't know if you can see those by my end of my finger there, but anyway, it's, there's just a lot of it. And I say a lot, I mean it, you know, if you just hold it arm's length away from you, it looks perfect. But when you get up really close and examine it, there's a lot of little flaws. And I think those little flaws are gonna show up uh, based on what I saw in my test. So I'm trying to get rid of them. So it looks like I've got quite a bit more sanding to do, even after sanding it for a very long time with the 320. We'll just have to uh, stay with it because I don't think this is going to work until I get it really, really, really smooth. Well, my friends, I went back to 220 sandpaper because the 320 just wasn't cutting it, no pun intended. It, the 320 was just too smooth to get out these little micro scratches. The wood is, is softer than the other curly maple, but it's hard enough, especially in alternating places, that you do need a, a 220 sandpaper to cut it. The 320, well, I'll probably go back to the 320 and top this off with the 320 when I'm done. But right now, I don't see any flaws on this side of it at all. I still see a little flaw or two on the other side and, and right through here and areas. I also want to address the comments about my sanding techniques using my fingers. You know, I have been using my fingers for 40 years doing this. And I just want to say one thing. If you haven't learned how to sand something without leaving grooves in it in 40 years, then you really haven't learned very much. You haven't learned very much at all. And I don't leave grooves in things when I'm sanding with my fingers. Just so you know, even though it may look different from your armchair, this is as smooth as glass. But there are still little micro flaws in there that you can't even feel, they're so small. But you can see them when you get up really close. My friends, I've sanded on this with, I went back to 220 and I sanded on it for a, for a solid hour I don't see any significant flaws in it now. If you get down with a microscope, you can still see a few little minor details. But I'm about done. I wetted the sides, and you can see what that's done to the look of that. So I'm going to wet the back, mainly just to raise the grain and sand it one more time. I figure that ought to get it as close as I can get it. But this also, I thought you'd get a kick out of see the curl in this. Oh my gosh, is there ever curl in this? I think the water shows it actually better than the uh, finish does the, because the water penetrates deeper. But look at that curl, oh my gosh. Melissa has been bantering back and forth with me that this is not going to be the most beautiful. She said the Canada mandolin was the most beautiful and this one will never be that beautiful. Well, I'll bet you this one is that beautiful. This is some gorgeous wood. So there you go. And of course, Melissa's free to put her comment on the screen. <laughs> but anyway, think that maybe by just wetting this down one more time, letting it just dry slowly, maybe the grain will raise one more time and maybe I can get the final, final detail sanded out of it. Because I gotta tell you, this hasn't sanded easily. You know, you can sand this wood better than you can carve it, no question about that, but that doesn't mean it's easy to sand, if that makes sense. It's, you know, it sands better than it carves, but it still doesn't sand easy. So we'll see how that does. Maybe that'll 
be good enough to get it down to the final sanding and then we can start staining this puppy. Man, I don't think you could find more beautiful wood if you looked really hard. That is some beautiful stuff right there. And the book matching from one side to the other it just blows me away. I did not expect that at all. You can see a face there. There's eye, eye, nose, mustache, mouth. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It looks like a face, doesn't it? In the camera, it does anyway. I actually, I, when I look at it here in person, I don't see it. But when I see it on the screen, I actually see the face. I don't know how it's coming out to you. But here in person, I don't see that face very well. But it's really pretty, that is for sure. Well, I'm gonna let that dry. <laughs>